You're listening to the Struck Podcast. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And here on Struck, we talk about everything aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. All right, welcome back to the Struck Podcast. This is episode 34. And on today's show, we've got some news, some engineering, and some EVTOL action for you today. So number one, we're going to chat about the A380, one of Airbus's largest offerings, uh, kind of being phased out, it sounds like. A recent incident with an A320 that was not downed per se, not almost down. I don't think it was really almost down, but it sounds like the pilots were very heavily affected, which put them in a really scary situation uh, by fumes coming in the cockpit, which is crazy. Also, we're going to chat a little bit about Spirit Aerosystems third quarter results and some optimism from their leadership. In our engineering segment, we're going to talk about by aerospace. They've got an investment from a Korean company, which sounds promising. And lastly, in the EVTOL segment, we'll chat about Joby, who has recently filed a bunch of patents, which is starting to shed some light on some of their technology. So, Alan, first, let's start with the A380. So, Highfly, which is one of only apparently 15 companies that ever uh, leased or operated uh, the A380 because it's just such a darn big aircraft. Um, but they said they're planning to phase this out. They've done three years of, of leasing it, and now they're going to kind of move forward and, and swap their A380s for more A330s. So is this a trend that mm-hmm. you expect to continue? Yeah, that's why the 747 has gone away also, and the, and the 777 is having a little bit of struggle on the new development side. It's four-engine airplanes and large uh, multi-aisle airplanes are going away because international travel has gone to zero and it doesn't make any sense to have four engines anymore. And uh, as we, there's some huge consolidation in, in the industry, the A380 is, is, and it seems hard to believe because it hasn't been around all that long, but the A380 is going away. And I'd be in a couple of years, you won't be able to see it really, uh, maybe besides a museum. And it's hard to think about the evolution of aircraft because we, there's some aircraft that have been around so long that you just become ubiquitous that mm-hmm. you could say 747 to pretty much anybody in the planet and they would know what you're talking about. But there, in that same cycle, there's been all kinds of airplanes that have come and gone. And it takes a very unique aircraft to last tens and twenties and 30 year spans. It just doesn't happen all that often. So uh, it, it, it is special uh, that some of these airplanes have lived as long as they have and been in service as long as they have. The A380 really wasn't one of them. It was pushing a particular segment of the aircraft market, the the, the large volume traffic market, the upper uh, end of the marketplace for the most part, because uh, you're burning a bunch of fuel and it just never, and, lo- and long haul too. Uh, so it just didn't really make any sense after a while. And, and even though fuel prices are low right now, it just... There's just not a customer base for it. It just really isn't. And I think you see a lot of other airplanes kind of get stuck in that same mold. Anything that is really dedicated to international travel routes is going to have problems for the next year or two until things settle out from COVID. And there's nothing to do about it, which is the sad part. Because, you know, there's been a ton of work and engineering time to go to an A380 and all the other airplanes that, that serve the international marketplaces. And it's just being idled, essentially which is never good because uh, we need to have the ability to move across the planet. And right right now, we've essentially shut it all down, uh, which is just not good. And you see that in the employment numbers for like Boeing and Airbus and a bunch of other aircraft manufacturers. Mitsubishi sounds like they've, they're mothballing their space jet. Uh, that That is you know, sort of expected in sort of the economic conditions we're in today. But the trouble is, is that you start losing a lot of the engineers and the talent that you had to develop those projects and they wander off and do something else. And when you have to get to the next A380 type project, they're not coming back because the turbulence in the aircraft market is for a certain segment of society. (laughs) It just is. It's It's a hard life and it doesn't necessarily seem like it. It seems like a glamorous life. You get to drink coffee and sit in co- conference rooms all day, but <laughs> it's actually a pretty difficult life. And um, once you lose the engineers, uh, from what I've seen, 50% of them will come back. Maybe, maybe they'll find some other place that's more stable. And that's the trouble. 
Yeah, so this isn't that old of an airplane either, especially compared to the 747. Nope. I mean, this is 2005, the first prototype was revealed. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, who's going to take the loss on this? I mean, is it the leasing Airbus. companies or it's Airbus? Is Airbus uh, leasing them? Well, or? yeah. Well, it depends on, you know, when you have a lease situation, every, it's just like a rental car. Every mile that you it's in use, you're making money on. You're, someone's paying you for that opportunity to fly the aircraft. So the leasing companies don't tend to do too poorly in those transactions. As long as the aircraft is being leased and flown, you're happy. It, it just comes about when they you own this aircraft and it's parked that you start to take it uh, in on the negative column. You start to go into the red on the economics of it. And on an, on an A380, I'm sh sure the thought process was this aircraft could fly 40, 50 years. We can be making money. We can be making money 30, 40 years out with the same aircraft, possibly. Mm -hmm. That's a remarkable f feat if you can pull it off. I know a lot of aircraft after the 20 year span tend to, tend to go away, but you know, something that large, you tend to want to keep it around and treat it nicely so you can make big dollars because everything's paid for essentially once you get past about year six or seven on that on as the owner it's hopefully you paid it off and the rest is just cash yeah. but yeah so it's hard you know i think probably the 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 companies that have leased a380s have made their money and had a little bit of income but that's going to stop now well speaking of airbus an a320 and this is such a this strikes me such a weird story that basically a a, a cessna citation owned by netjets uh took off like a minute before an Airbus A320 operated by Vueling. I'm probably uh, pronouncing that wrong. Um, and basically, like the cabin filled with fumes, and the and the pilots were reported fumes from the Cessna. They basically told on them, <laughs> and uh, so, but <laughs> but they had some real real were really affected by it. I mean, one of them went to the to the to the toilet. To uh, I don't know. I mean, they were so nauseous that both of them were very heavily affected. And wow. uh, I mean, this creates a really serious situation. And I mean, you wonder like if, what if just the cabin door was closed and they both just passed out and you just didn't know. I mean, I guess that could potentially happen obviously, but I said seven yeah. minutes after taking off that, you know, the uh, the crew was really monitoring the cabin and, uh, or the, the, the pilots and mm -hmm. just a really strange hazardous situation. And they're not exactly sure why this went down like that. But I mean, is this, is this really that abnormal, or this strikes me as pretty weird? I think it's abnormal. Usually, the the Airbus and the Boeing airplanes, their air inlets are where well, they suck in air for to provide pressurization. It tends to be under the wing or in that fairing underneath the wing. There's packs in there that bring in the fresh air. So I, I kind of wonder if it's a, just the size of the Citation versus the A320, because the Citation is relatively low to the ground, but is it on the same level as the incoming air inlets for the Airbus? And if they, if usually, I don't know if you ever stood, stood behind uh, a jet airplane, it smells, you can you can smell the burnt kerosene coming off the back side of that thing. It, it, it is, can be overpowering. And that's why you don't stand there. But if they happen to suck that in into their um, environmental control system on the Airbus, you may not really notice. You, you may not really notice it. I, I always think kerosene has a kind of a sweet smell to it, and I, and you know you're around an airport because you can smell that jet fuel, that kerosene burning. And I'm surprised that pilots didn't think, "Wow, oh, that's weird. I'm smelling kerosene." But along with that kerosene smell are the byproducts of combustion, which one is carbon monoxide. So if, if you're sucking in a bunch of carbon monoxide into the environmental control system for the Airbus, uh, you would get really sick, I think, because it, the filtration system wouldn't remove the carbon monoxide. And you know, carbon monoxide poisoning kills a lot of people uh, a year. And, and the, the symptoms are, uh, one of the early symptoms are, is that uh, like your features get red, like your, li your lips start to get bright red, mm -hmm. right? And then you start to get this nauseous feeling. You get, like, get light headed and, and dizzy. And those are always the, the markers like, hey, I got to get some fresh air. Well, in an Airbus cockpit, you can't just, well, I don't think you can. Well, you can't roll down the window for sure. I'm not sure if you can pop the windows out. Some aircraft, you can kind of pop the windows out and get some fresh air in. But you wouldn't be thinking about that at the time. Yeah. So it, it is weird that the pilots let that go on 
and got to the point where they got nauseous. Like that's pretty serious stuff. Yeah, because it, it when you, your brain is not getting the right amount of oxygen, that's why you're feeling sick. So if you're not thinking straight, you're not flying straight, and that's rule number one. And always have all your mental capacities working at full speed when you're flying. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's definitely scary. So shifting away from Airbus, uh, so one of Boeing's major suppliers is Spirit Aerosystems. Mm -hmm. And Alan, what, what components? They produce the fuselage, is that right? But lots of other things, large, right? Large sections of, yeah. of aircraft, yeah. Wings, fuselage, yeah. Mm -hmm. So really good article from Composites World. Uh, basically, Spirit's third quarter revenue this year was $806 million, down from $1.92 billion in the same quarter last year. Uh, Yet, even though they've laid off 8,000 employees this year and closed a, a plant in Oklahoma, um, you know, there's some optimism and it seems, I don't know, they seem some kind of sunny statements from their leadership uh, despite that. So how do you feel about Spirit Air Systems and, and this uh, this announcement? Well, that's a delta of a billion dollars, right? <laughs> Is that what you just read off to me? A billion dollar delta between last year and this year? Wow, that's a lot of money. Uh, I, I know there's had a lot of layoffs happen at Spirit, just trying to keep the cash flow somewhat controlled because all the, all the aircraft manufacturing is essentially down to a snail's pace. It, it, there's not much moving out there. And if you're building the, the large sections of aircraft, you want to continue to do that, but it's going to be do, done at a reduced rate. And that reduced rate means you just need less labor and you're just going to start cutting overhead as much as you can to 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 keep the production line open, but I think they're on a, on a larger scale company like that. They're desperately needed as they're sort of a vital piece to Boeing and other aircraft manufacturers' success. Spirit sort of stationed itself as like a real structural expert, and they are. They're they're they make fantastic components and and st structural sections, so. I think they're seeing that there's going to be a little bit of uptick probably into this year, beginning of next year. If they can just weather through it and get six months down the line, it may get to back to some level of normalcy. Even if that was just at 75% the normal rate, I think they'd be happy with that. And Boeing would be too. Airbus, everybody's going to be happy with that if we can get to that point. Uh, but we need to make sure that we don't lose, like I was saying before, we don't want to lose all the all the special people that make those aircraft parts as good as they are because yeah. they're hard to get back. Well, and the optimism is that they'll get back to profitability um, or positive free cash flow by 2022. And a mm -hmm. lot of that is with the 737 coming back online, the 737 MAX. Yeah. So they're yeah. eagerly awaiting that aircraft's return. All right, so in our engineering segment today, we're going to chat about Buy Aerospace. So they've got an investment from a South Korean company called Aerospace 9, and they've also agreed to purchase 300 of their all-electric aircraft. And wow. uh, yeah, so it seems like a pretty... So it sounds like they're going to do 150 E-Flyer 2s and 148 E-Flyer 4s, which is the four-seat variation, and two, on, two envoys which is their uh, their nine-seater that they're soon um, going to be announcing. So it's a pretty big deal, Alan. And I know, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, you're very aware of uh, by aerospace. So yeah. what uh, what are your thoughts initially about this partnership? I, ha I hadn't seen a lot about that announcement besides that it had happened. I didn't realize that they had sold that many aircraft. That's a fantastic sale. <laughs> it, it, just because if they're selling at that high of number of aircraft during a pandemic, if they can get to 2022, then the sales may really skyrocket. But the the, the whole key to, to buy aerospace and all the electric aircraft companies is that the reduced cost of ownership, not so much that the aircraft is less expensive. It's, oh, aircraft are expensive, relatively speaking, to an automobile or a house for that matter. But 
if you can keep the operation operational cost down, if you're running a flight training school or if you're running training Air Force pilots uh, in in South Korea, it may be a good fit because the operational expenses add up over time. And if you plan to keep the aircraft around for a long time, those operational costs keeping them down really is a huge long term savings. And I think that's why you're seeing so much interest in the electric aircraft market. Is is just the operational costs are so much lower. You're not you're not burning fuel, you're not storing fuel, uh, you're not repairing an inter internal combustion engine, so the maintenance times will be down. Uh, you can do a lot of unique things with the aircraft design because the, the motors are so small compared to an internal combustion engine. Uh, if, if you think about, uh, I know it's, Dan, you've worked on cars before, so you know what mm -hmm. like a Chevy 350 engine is. It's kind of the size of an aircraft motor. Roughly, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, that's on a you know a single engine uh, piston airplane, and now you're getting motors that are like, and I, <laughs> I'm going to put this in perspective, like a record, <laughs> a vinyl record in the old days. <laughs> it's about that diameter, and it's about maybe I don't know less than a foot deep or somewhere in there. They're tiny compared to an internal combustion engine, but they produce a tremendous amount of the torque and horsepower. Uh, so it just opens a door tremendously to aerodynamic savings uh fuel savings uh, maintenance savings and yeah I, I think this is a good indicator for that whole industry that there is going to be a big demand pull if they can get the aircraft certified and and buy as well on their way to getting that done they've they've got a great engineering uh crew out there in colorado and i i you know it's just a matter of getting the aircraft done and I, which i think they will get done and so can you speak to the, that market a little bit? So these are the E-Flyer is a trainer aircraft. So for those who are in the industry, yeah. like what is a trainer aircraft for? Like who buys them? I mean, where does this fit into the aviation world? Uh, there's really two marketplaces. It's just the average consumer that wants to learn how to fly. There's a lot of flight training schools around the world. Uh, and they tend to have uh, several aircraft and it'd be a, an epicenter. So if I have a, a, a flight training school, say in Silicon Valley, I may have 20 aircraft in my fleet because it's like any other rental company. The more they fly, the more I get paid. And the more, and the, the flight training costs are relatively expensive. And you have a, a flight instructor with a novice pilot going out to fly around. And you, so there's, there's a profit to be made there. So from a financial standpoint, if you can entice new pilots into the program, it's, it can be can make some decent money. And it, especially if you can lower the operational cost for that new pilot, because the, the first sticker shock you get is like the cost of fuel and the cost to, to, to essentially rent the aircraft for an hour can add up. So you, you, you find this sort of de line of demarcation on at what, uh, level people can afford to do it. So you have to have income levels, you know, let's just say above $100,000 a year, maybe $200,000 a year to really go after it. Not necessarily, but if I think it kind of takes a sort of money because it's expensive. It yeah, just is. But if you can lower, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not, yeah. But if you can lower those training costs down and you entice more people into your industry, uh, yeah, I think it, make, it can make sense financially because a lot of people want to learn how to fly and especially with this ev tolls coming around like somebody's got to learn how to fly those things mm -hmm. and, it, and the second market is really the the military side there's like the air force academy in colorado which uh trains i think they're trained pilots and gliders and cessnas or cirruses i forget what they have or diamonds i forget what they have out there but in that first entry-level aircraft you don't want to be a super uh, acrobatic type aircraft. You want to be a very docile recovery, stable recovery kind of aircraft. So these new pilots can learn how to fly. And so there's really two marketplaces there. And you can think about the number of pilots that go through military training around the world. It's, it's a good number of pilots and they have to start somewhere. And, and the E-Flyer 2 is probably a pretty good baseline for most of them. All right, in our final segment today, we're going to chat a little bit about Joby Aviation, which Joby is one of the leaders for sure. They seem to be pretty stable, like firmly at ahead of, of many of the other challengers here in the, uh, in the air taxi market, all, you know, whatever you want to call it. But some interesting news out of evtol.news, so electrical vertical takeoff and landing news. 
um, and they put out tons of really great information. So definitely go check out their website. They've uh, Joby has released a lot of patents, and so Alan, what is why is that significant? I mean, this seems newsworthy, but what's the big deal about patents? <laughs> well, it, it locks in the technology so that no one else can use it, or if they want to use it, they have to pay you for it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's sort of like what Tesla has done, but you know, Tesla let those patents be used for free to, to grow the industry. But Joby has a, a number of interesting patents having to do with um, the way they articulate the thrust. So the the on if you think about like a V22, which is a tilt rotor, and they have these big turbo fan engines on the ends of the wing, those whole engines rotate. So the whole pylon and assembly around them rotate to get from a vertical flight to a horizontal flight. Well, when you use an electric motor, the, the motors are relatively small, so you don't have to rotate the whole pylon assembly. You can just basically leverage out the motor <laughs> and flip it 90 degrees and reduce the drag one and two the complexity of the whole thing if you can just mechanically flip the motor out and go to horizontal or to vertical flight from horizontal flight so there's a lot of little tricks you can do because these motors are so dang small mm -hmm. uh, that and i think that's where a lot of the technology is and obviously you, so you got other problems which joby is trying to address which are battery cooling always a problem motor cooling always a problem and then some aerodynamic aspects around motor cooling it looks like uh, and there's, there's a whole pile of, of patents there. I'm not sure. Well, a lot of them are applications still. At least I was just looking online here a little while ago. Some of them are still applications, which means you got to go through the process, which tends to be a two to three year process, which there's a lot of people going to, uh, there's a lot of big players in that market space right now. So someone uh, can can um, go after it and say, yeah, I already invented that. And so you, there's, a, there's a process involved with patents, which is painful and expensive. So, so if they do get patents, that's, that's great. But just, um, you know, it gives you an insight into what the design of the of their aircraft is going to be, which is more exciting. And if you can sort of piece things together, you can get a sense of where they're going, which is taking advantage of, one, the, the, the simplicity and the, the compact size of an electric motor, and, and two, uh, leveraging the flexibility that comes with electric power. And if you can do those two things uh, efficiently, then you can set yourself apart in the marketplace. And when Joby has uh, funding from Toyota, right? So mm -hmm. the, uh, I, if Toyota's hopefully is helping them, because Toyota has a lot of mechanical knowledge, matter of fact, you know how to do, <laughs> they know how to do a lot of strange mechanical things. And it can, sometimes Toyota does think out of the box, particularly um, in some of the race teams, they tend to think out of the box. So uh, they can bring something to the table there. But I think it's interesting that Joby is really clicking down the line in terms of creating patents and creating usable usable technology that they they think has value to them and, and they're going off and patenting it which is fascinating so we haven't seen that out of a lot of the other ev tail companies we haven't seen a lot of patents come out we've heard a lot of discussion about you know ip they have technology but if you start really searching deep you don't see a lot there uh, joby thinks they have something all right well that'll do it for today's episode of struck if you're new to the show, thank you so much for listening and please leave a review and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out the WeatherGuard Lightning Tech YouTube channel for video episodes, full interviews, and short clips from the show. And follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Our handle is at WG Lightning. Tune in next Tuesday for another great episode on aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. Strike Tape, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech's proprietary lightning protection for radomes, provides unmatched durability for years to come. If you need help with your radome lightning protection, reach out to us at weatherguardaero.com. That's weatherguardaero.com.